Welcome, Mike, to a missional moment here at Union Baptist Association. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. And uh, good to have you with us, too. We are very grateful to God that we can be able to meet with Brother Mike. Mike is uh, what I call a mover and shaker. He's changing not only communities, not only lives, but making history, I think. Uh, Mike's been with us before. Uh, been, he was interviewed uh, back, oh, I guess close to 2007 or 8, and uh, you're back again with some results of what God is doing uh, through your life. So, Mike, welcome again to Mission A Moment. Thank you. Mike, uh, your ministry now is called Generation One. Tell us how it all got started, and uh, I think you said January 2007, that you, you got an experience from, with God, and all of a sudden you wind up in Third Ward. We had uh, just finished a year of uh, disaster relief in Katrina, mm -hmm. came back, uh, around uh, August, September of 06, and uh, caught up on some sleep for about three weeks and then started praying to God, you know, what's next? Cannot go back inside the walls of a church. I've got to stay out here and, and get something done. And uh, um, he gave us a vision then, poverty and suffering in the inner city, mm -hmm. and specifically the third ward. So uh, people ask me, how did you end up in the third ward? And I say, faith and ignorance. <laughs> uh, faith, I knew God sent us, and ignorance of what it meant, what the inner city was all about, and, and anything at all about inner city ministry. We drove in in probably September of, of 06 and met with uh, a church there, a local church, every week uh, until December when they finally uh, uh, agreed to allow us to start our ministry in their uh, upstairs offices. Mm -hmm. And that was in January of 07. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I, I think I met you a couple of times during that period of time, but it was in 2005 that Henry Blackaby came to town uh, over at Grace Community Church on the south side of Houston. And you participated in that, that conference. It was a, a day and a half, I think maybe a two and a half day conference with Dr. Blackaby, who wrote a book called Fresh Encounter, uh, which is a, um, an opportunity for the body of Christ to be refreshed uh, through repentance. And that day, you explained to me that that was an encounter with God of that day that li literally changed your life. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, that was January of 05, and uh, I was out there desperately searching for God, uh, absolutely wanting to be working for Him full-time. As of that time, haven't, uh, I wasn't in full-time ministry, was trying to get there, uh, didn't know how to get there, actually thought man would put me there <laughs> and, and make those decisions. So I was trying to impress men, pastors, and different people saying, hey, I need to be on somebody's staff somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I went to uh, to uh, the Blackaby uh, Conference, and, and over those two days, uh, God clearly uh, gave me 13 different things to change about myself, mm -hmm. uh, to do differently, to repent of, and, and just they, they were taking me down the wrong road. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he told me there, you know, uh, I'm the promoter of men. I'll, I'll put you where you need to be. You don't need to impress anybody mm -hmm. but me. Wow. And, uh, mm -hmm. and just cl cleansed me of a lot of uh, false notions of how to get into ministry, or at least the ministry he wanted me in. And I remember the, the last day when we had the, the corporate prayer and there was a, a mad rush for the pulpit. Everybody just hit their knees mm -hmm. and prayed. And, and I went there and prayed and, and just uh, had probably the first real clear uh, moment with God mm -hmm. where he started directing my life. And wow. that, that was the beginning. And that was January. And uh, I cleaned up those 13 things by August. And he sent us to Katrina mm -hmm. uh, to be trained in, uh, in ministry. Mm -hmm. And we spent a year doing disaster relief there with Core Alliance, mm -hmm. Core Disaster Relief. Mm -hmm. Came back from that. And that was our, uh, uh, the uh, January of 05 was, this is what you need to do differently and change. August of 05 to August of 06 was an intensive uh, one-year training program uh -huh. in disaster relief that related to social economic relief as well. Came back from that and was sent into the third war. Wow. So God did a thing in your heart, yes, which was return you back to your first love, which was him. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes, we you know, we get caught up with... Um, what we want to do for God instead of what walking with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does the, the doing through us. A friend of mine calls that do you know, It's where God wants to get the praise from it yeah. and not man. Yeah. And uh, you repented of that and you had an encounter, a fresh encounter with the living God. Yes. You know, that's the pattern of revival in most people's lives. But he, here again, then God began to take you to the place where you can hear from him, where you can be engaged in the, being equipped to do the work that God called you to do. And you came back to a real war zone mm -hmm. in Third Ward. Yeah. I'm amazed by that, bro, because Third Ward is colored people's time. And I can say that. I don't know if you can say that or not, but it's 
colored people's town. It is a place where African freed slaves had settled and uh, began to erase family and the whole bit. And now it has turned into a war zone. Uh, talk about that for us for a little bit. Yeah, it was made clear to me when I first showed up that I was white and uh, it was a black community. <laughs> uh, that There was no getting that by anybody. Uh, I was told by several uh, church leaders, pastors, you know, uh, who are you? You're the next white boy to come in here and, and promise all these things and say you're going to do this and do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I found immediately, I, well, I went into the third ward, faith, ignorance, and very naive. I thought everybody's going to love us. Everybody's going to want to work together. We're all trying to do the same thing. And I found out that was the farthest from the truth. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to work together. Nobody was doing the same thing. Uh, everybody had their own agenda. And mm -hmm. what I realized quickly was, the bridge had been burned on both ends. Mm. Uh, churches with, with good meaning hearts and attentions came in and were burned by the community. Mm. Uh, churches who came in to serve their own agenda burned the community. Mm. So there was mistrust and broken bridges. Both ends of the bridge was broken. Mm. And it took us a, a little while to, to mend both those bridges, both those ends of the bridge, and mm. get the churches to come back and the community to accept it. But we definitely uh, were not really trusted and really accepted for the first two years. Wow. Um, we had a lot of churches come in. Not a, we had a lot of churches come in, and some would complain as we painted houses or cleared a lot or did these things. You know, the community is not thanking me. The community is not coming out and helping me paint their house. And I said, well, they're scared to death of you. There's there's 25 people surrounding their house they've never seen before, <laughs> and you're scraping and painting. And and uh, it took two years to build a trust and for them to see a consistency that we weren't leaving. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have come in. Uh, the fire's too hot and they leave pretty quickly. And that's what they thought we were going to do. Mm. I think they were calling us the suburbanites. You know, uh -huh. don't, don't trust those suburbanites. They're going to leave <laughs> soon, uh, especially, you know, the community as a whole and, and also the, uh, the kids we were trying to reach. Mm -hmm. They've had so much rejection. The last thing they wanted to do was allow hope of, uh, of a relationship and a commitment for somebody. Yeah. So those kids would be as nasty as they could be um, to push us away when at the same time they need us and want us so bad. Mm -hmm. And it was over two years uh, of taking kids to summer camps and, and vacation Bible schools and after school programs before we met one mom. Mm -hmm. And after about two years, one mom showed up, you know, no, you've been taking my son to summer camp and doing all these things. I said, I'd like to get to know you. And somewhere after two years, the first people in the community started coming out of the house and helping the teams paint the house. Wow. Somewhere after that, as we'd clean a lot, neighbors would come out and clean a lot next to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then just slowly but surely, you know, uh, as as we've had over uh, 17,000 volunteers, 18, wow. actually now 18,000 volunteers. Since 2007? Yes. Wow. And since January 2007, we've had 18,000 volunteers come through. And it's taken all of that, uh, each one of them representing the light of Christ and the hands and feet to uh, uh, just kind of mend those, those broken bridges and mend those hurts, uh, be a consistent uh, mm -hmm. uh, light in the community to build trust. Mm -hmm. And based on that trust, we were able to, in that acceptance, we were able to start a school mm -hmm. uh, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, uh, based on, on continued trust and acceptance, uh, we were able to start a t-shirt printing business mm -hmm. uh, a couple months ago. I want to talk about that later because I think that's a, 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 a recent result of what God is doing in the, the Third Ward area. Um, for the sake of our audience, I, I'd like for you to try to describe Third Ward. I mean, it's, it's a war zone. I mean, it's not a place where the Lord is, if you will, even though there's a church on every corner. And next door to it is a crack house on every, by, next door to the church, on both sides of the church, you know, the vacant lots and so forth, the type of people that are there. Uh, could you kind of just talk about that a little bit, tell that story about Third Ward itself? Yeah, well, what we're talking about is the bottoms of the Third Ward, you know, traditionally one of the top 20 poorest communities in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, U of University of Houston. It's in between University of Houston and downtown Houston. You got a billion dollar budget university and six miles across, you got a trillion dollar skyline. And in between those two things and Texas Southerns over here, uh, you've got one of the poorest, uh, desperate communities in the country. Mm -hmm. um, I-45 and 59 North kind of border it as well. So that's the area we're working in. Mm -hmm. And it's been an area uh, without hope for a long time. It's been an area without fathers for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's been an area without any kind of positive instruction for the, mm -hmm. the community for a long time. So uh, people, uh, the kids grow up there uh, with very little supervision. And or, or maybe the supervision that uh, the parents or the grandparents or the guardians are capable of providing. Um, it's just been, uh, there's just been no mm -hmm. instruction, no education mm -hmm. of how to be successful and move out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of politics down there. There's a lot of uh, 
I'm talking the church now, but there's a lot of politics within politicians, the churches, the different ministries down there. A lot of people have just created little islands all over the place. Mm. And really some of them, and there's a lot of great people down there as well, but a lot of these churches and ministries just serve themselves their own agenda right here and ignore everything around them. So there's a, there's a huge gap between the residents there and the churches. There's 52 churches uh, in the bottoms. And for the most part, none of them are really engaged in that community. Uh, the, the churches have, accept, uh, have accepted the fact that they're not going to deal with the community. The community knows that, and they don't go to the churches. Mm-hmm. So, so where are they getting their members from? Uh, other parts of Houston to come back in? Uh, a lot of the churches there, the members come from Sugar Land, Katy, Pearland, Missouri City, wow. Clear Lake. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, you know, a lot of them the commute, suburbs. A lot of them commute 30, 45 minutes in. Wow. Uh, there's uh, a lot of those churches, like you mentioned, are, are 100, 140 years old. Mm-hmm. A lot of historical significance. Mm-hmm. And that attracts people. They've had a, mm-hmm. maybe grandma went there. Somebody went there in their family. And well, we're doing the civil rights movement. These churches were the places where the civil rights was taking effect across America. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming out of Third Ward, uh, they had heritage of prayer, evangelism, missions, and church planting. Um, but over the past 45 years, that something happened. And, uh, but, uh, you know, God wanted something to happen. And he sent folks like you and many others, cross-ethnic and denominational lines, uh, into this community. It's very amazing. Uh, but go on. Anything else you'd like to share with us about this community? Because I'm, I'm intrigued about your uh, idea of the church uh, creating islands. That's really interesting. Yeah, there's basically 52 islands uh, within the Third Ward. Um, and, and we've just seen that uh, the people there, you know, a lot of people uh, want to say they're helping fight the injustice of the inner city, but uh, they fight it by just being angry and protesting mm-hmm. and, and, and raising cane. Mm-hmm. But they, they don't come into the inner city and empower somebody, educate somebody, no, get to know any family there. They, they, they themselves who uh, proclaim they're the fighters for the injustice, um, appear to just be very angry and, and like to make a lot of noise on TV. Um, you don't see them actually meeting families, talking to people, uh, having an after school program, you know, doing anything to empower somebody out of it. So uh, the community realizes that as well. They, they look at all these people arguing and yelling and, and, and fighting for them, but not really with them. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I walk the streets and get to know people and, and certainly, you know, uh, there's, there's gang members, there's drug dealers, there's prostitutes, there's all these things down there. Um, but as you look in their eyes, uh, they're people who want to hope, they want to believe, they want a different life. Mm-hmm. There's just not a, a, a different life available for them. Mm-hmm. I would say probably 90% of who you know we would call a drug dealer or a gang member would walk off that corner in a second if we could provide them a job. Wow. Now, you can. It's, it's not as easy as they just walk into downtown and interview. You know, they <laughs> they uh, they they don't have. Uh, a great education. He's got teardrops. They, and <laughs> they've got tattoos everywhere. They look different. They look scary. Yeah. You know, they're born into a survival mode where they have to look scary. Mm-hmm. But once you get past that very fierce look, mm-hmm. they're teddy bears inside and they want to do something different. Mm-hmm. If you can just show them the way. Wow. You know, we, um, in 2009, uh, a group called the fire torch Houston got together and began to see the condition of the land. And, uh, this idea of uh, having the people of God who have been given the inheritance of the land and to see the condition of the land, uh, even with all these little lighthouses uh, within the community, caused us to kind of look to see, you know, why is there the diminishing of the light? And when we discovered that the light was diminishing, we began to take a deep breath and we began to say, Okay, uh, if there's a lack of light, darkness is not the problem. It's the lack of light that's the problem, mm-hmm. which we begin to take responsibility for it by going to communities or churches, calling them to come together to repent of the lack of light, coming together to pray, to seek the face of God. And one of those days was in Third Ward, and we had about 30 churches come together that day uh, at a park called Our Park. And the reason why we were there is because um, the local TV station did a, a news report on the condition of Third Ward. All the prostitutes that were walking the streets in broad daylight and the, the kids couldn't go to the parks because of needles and drugs and all of the things that were taking place there at our park. And so they interviewed 
uh, the police department and the police department says, well, we're arresting prostitutes and drug dealers left and right. And uh, we're doing our part. But they said, go talk to the people. We, we need their help. And then they went to the people and, and the people said, well, all we want you to do is to take these bad people off the streets. These were folks who lived in the community and that was their solution. The police were supposed to do that. And the police said the community was supposed to do that. So they visited a community leader and said, what is your thought? And he said, if you, if you look around, you see a lot of churches on every corner and you see a lot of businesses. You see a lot of people that go out and come in to do business and do church and they go in and out, in and out. And he said this, he says, if they would just walk the streets and talk to the people. And this is a community leader in this community that everybody knows. And he says, if they would just do that, it will make a big difference in our community. Mm -hmm. That's when we came to our part and we began to go to those established 100 year old congregations and kneel in the front lawn of those churches and asking God to forgive me and my fathers for we have sinned. The, the freed slaves, their children are now living in bondage. And now we come to ask God to bring some divine hydraulics to lift this stuff out. And that's when we really met you. And, and we found out that God was there already. He was just inviting us to join him in that community uh, to bring about transformation. Now, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. It was right after that that we discovered that you had a vision of uh, starting uh, some schools inside of churches to, to reach out to the at-risk population, kids who could not make it in public school. They couldn't even think straight in preschool. But you had this vision. Talk about that now. Since we did the prayer march, we've repented, and it just seems like heaven has given you a dream. Talk about that. Well, uh, it was about uh, this time last year, January, February last year. Uh, you know, at different times we've we've run up to which three, is 2011. 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, we've run up to about three basketball teams at a time, depending on how many coaches we can come down. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, our older team was hitting 15, 16 years old at that time. Some of them just getting 17. And last January, February, like in one week, in a matter of two days, I found out four had been shot. Uh, more than half of our 15-year-olds uh, had had babies. Wow. Um, a couple went to jail. A couple dropped out of school. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, floored me. I, was, I just went out in the street and started crying out to God. I said, we've been working with these kids for over four years. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still getting shot, still having babies, still going to jail, still dropping out of school. Nothing's changed. I said, God, you know, I can go back to Clear Lake and golf every day and, and get yeah. the same results. You know, what, what's the deal? What, what can we do more? And he just gave us a vision. Of, and, and what I found was, uh, as deep as your pain and concern is, that's how high your, your passion can rise. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he had to create some serious pain and hurt to mm. uh, build up a passion big enough uh, to start a brand new school that's, that, as far as we know, hasn't been done anywhere. Wow. And uh, he gave us a vision to have classrooms of, of no more than 12 kids, a teacher, a teacher's aide, and a volunteer at all times. So it's a one-to-four ratio. And we also uh, have additional volunteers to come in. Our goal is one-on-one -on -one ratio in the school. Mm -hmm. We have two grade levels per classroom and many, many different things. We, we tr tried to flip the education system upside down and grab little pieces at work and put them all into one. And we want to put the, when we do put these classrooms into local churches, mm -hmm. that'll allow us. And the goal there is to engage that congregation into these kids' families' lives. Mm -hmm. And we uh, once a month, we bring the kids and as many of their parents and guardians that, as will come into that church to mm -hmm. introduce them to the church and get that congregation uh, comfortable uh, with them and try to engage them. Getting the congregation comfortable with them. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the church building is in the third ward. Right. But when everybody in the th everybody who goes there lives in Katy, the third ward is as foreign and scary to them as it is any other church in, in, in Katy or wow. in Sugar Land or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes a minute to, to build that relationship. Wow, it's amazing. So you, you have some schools already started in some of the most traditional and historical churches in the third ward part of Houston. And all of this took place uh, literally about two months after the prayer march. The prayer march was around Thanksgiving in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then in January, you're in the streets crying out. Yeah. It's amazing. We had our first meeting, uh, the beginning of the school in April of last year, mm -hmm. uh, and wow. we had no funding, no teachers, no curriculum, and really no idea how to build a school. That was April. 
and everybody's saying, hey, uh, so I guess you'll start this in 12 or 13. I said, kids are dying every day, going to jail every day, getting pregnant every day. We, we can't put this off a year. No, no. So that was April, August 22nd. Wow. Four months later, we started uh, pre-K four to fourth grade. Wow. And uh, this summer, uh, we plan to start a preschool and add a fifth grade class. Wow. It's amazing. So just literally four months into the year, you all of a sudden got some divine hydraulics. <laughs> and also, many churches from around Houston started contributing to this to this thing. Um, I think you, a lot of our churches in Union Baptist Association are, are part of supporting Generation One. Uh, what yeah, we uh, almost from the beginning, University Baptist Church was involved. Uh, from the beginning, Kingsland Baptist Church was involved, one of our longest and uh, mm -hmm. uh, biggest partners. Omar. Um, Omar Garcia, yeah. uh, John Davis, um, Sagemont Baptist Church, wow. Sugar Creek Church. Uh, they've really taken ownership of the third ward and come in right. strong. Wow. Uh, first and second Baptist uh, sending teams out and, and uh, getting involved. So. Wow, amazing. Some of the most significant missional congregations in our in our world is Baptist, but they are just cross denominational lines as well. I know, I know Sugar Creek has engaged in Third Ward, have adopted it as a mission field and a mission force for the kingdom of God. And it's amazing what God's doing there. Now, it's not only education is being turned around, and not only family and church, but also business. You've got a business going on now. Tell yeah. that story for us. Well, you know, uh, I joke a little bit. Uh, you know, these boys, the 15, 16 year old boys that uh, had the babies and got shot, created the school. Mm. And then after the school's up and running, you know, we're still fine tuning that. These boys are still out there and still getting in trouble. Mm. Um, one of them made the news last week, unfortunately, home invasion, and he's going to be gone for a while. Um, so I'm mm. still looking at these guys, and I, I, we know if we can't employ them and employ them in the third ward, uh, they're all going to become more of a statistic, and just uh, that generational curse is going to continue. Mm -hmm. So. We started a t-shirt printing business, Generation One Screen Printing, wow. and interviewed, uh, well, we, we asked about 14 teenagers to come interview, eight made it, and out of those eight, we hired, uh, we tried to hire six, one went to jail four days before we started, so we started with five guys, and a part of this job is mandatory Bible wow. study, mandatory uh, budgeting and finance classes, mm -hmm. mandatory fathering classes. You know, you want to accept a job, then you accept these classes. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing is, hope mm -hmm. was birthed in these boys. Wow. Um, one of them, you know, one of them has been shot before. Uh, I think all of them have been to jail. Uh, three of them have babies, and they absolutely want and thrive on these Bible studies, this budgeting class. Um, we had a banker come in and open up their bank accounts uh, last week. They'd never heard of savings accounts, checkings accounts, interest rates. Uh, uh, the lady was asking, uh, boys, do you have any questions? And they're just staring at her wide eyes. I laughed and said, man, this is the first time they've heard any of this. They, they don't even know what to ask. Um, but they, they're setting up a savings, you know, $50 from each check goes into their savings account. Wow. And they get, you know, prepaid debit cards so they can't get in trouble or go over. And, and uh, we had a lady come in um, and do a budgeting class on Saturday, and she was gonna do three Saturdays in a row, and they talked her into a fourth. Wow. Now this is the same boys that would be out getting in trouble all Friday night and sleep all day Saturday so they can get back in trouble Saturday night. Mm. They were up at 9.30 in the morning on Saturday talking about money management and mm. budgeting and then asked if they can wow. use another Saturday up to do budgeting. So hope has come alive and, and what this has really done is given us an in-house positive role model now. I told them, you may not realize it, you may not even want to be it, but you are now a positive role model. Mm. Now the kids can look at gangs, crime, and drugs, or they can look at you guys dressing right, thinking right, walking to work every day, doing a good job, uh, doing different things with your money. Now, you know, with uh, a lot of people in the inner city have no concept of the value of money because mm. they don't have to work for any money. The, the government or the church gives them everything they need. Mm. So they don't understand values of those Nikes and, and values of those big screen TVs and and, and mm. what it takes. So now these boys, mm -hmm. we started them at minimum wage and, and they've all, and at this point they've all earned a raise. We've mm -hmm. got to give them here soon. Mm -hmm. But now they know when somebody, when they want to go buy a pair of Nikes, they know now they can say, well, that, that took seven hours of work. I don't know if I want to put seven hours of work into a pair of these Nikes. Mm -hmm. A friend wants to borrow 40 bucks, you know, well, hold on a second. I worked three hours for that $40 and, and you've been outside playing dice. You know, you're just going to take my money and go play dice on the corner and give it to somebody else. <laughs> wow. I don't know that I can give that money away. Right. So they're starting to understand what the value of a dollar is. 
and how a dollar is earned. They, they haven't had that concept before. Mm. Um, you know, they were born into a world where the church or the government supplies every need, wow. and, and they don't understand that. You have described to us in the last few minutes what community transformation is all about. It is about God coming to a community through a group of people to restore its original divine intent. Because back in the late 1800s and 1900s, up to about 1960s, this community was known as a business starter mm -hmm. and a place for education. That's why University of Houston's there and Texas Southern. It was the haven for professionals, but now over the past 40, 50 years, it has deteriorated and uh, lost its divine purpose. But through repentance, because of the lack of light, God then responded by hearing their cry and the cry of Mike and many others on the streets of Third Ward. And he's begun to forgive our sin of the lack of light. And now he is healing the land. That's Second Chronicles 7, 14. Yeah, I, uh, there's a, a man that owns the two houses across from us, and he's in his 70s. He, was, he grew up in the Third Ward, and he brought me a picture uh, from 1942 wow. of his father's grocery store mm. and uh, described the neighborhood as a, a, a very businesslike, a lot of World War II veterans, mm -hmm. no vacant lots, uh, mm -hmm. houses everywhere, businesses everywhere. Nobody certainly on the streets during the day, everybody out working and being very productive. The churches uh, were packed. Churches were packed. Uh, it was an amazing time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, uh, somewhere 40, 50, 55 years ago, yeah. that started falling apart. Right. And I think we've identified it. It's uh, the lack of light. Mm -hmm. And Mike, thank you for being with us today. And uh, we want to let everybody know how to get in contact with you. So if you want to look into one of those cameras and say, hey, this is how you can contact me. Give them your full name and email address, phone number. And maybe they like to come out and volunteer or maybe come out and take a look and see what God is doing there. Yeah, we, we, we tell everybody, you know, you've heard the saying it takes a uh, village to raise a child. We're trying to raise the village to raise all these children. Wow. And we need tutors, mentors. Uh, we need churches to come down and paint houses and clear lots. Uh, we need everybody. We need business people. We need corporations. We need all the church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can go to our website, uh, www.generationone.net got our emails and phone numbers on there. You can see pictures, our Facebook, and, and see what we're doing. But we invite everybody to come. We need everybody in Houston. We've had 18,000 volunteers come in. You know, we need 60,000 more. You know, wow. it, it takes everybody. What would that look like if we would uh, wake up one morning and in the front page of our newspaper, it says, in Third Ward, the Lord is there. This is community transformation. This is our missional moment. Thanks for being with us, and uh, we'll be back uh, probably with more exciting guests to kind of tell us what's happening in our city and through our churches. So thank you for being with us today. And Mike, thank you so much, man, for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right.